Welcome to this, uh, our series on eschatology, the four last things. This is part three of our series here in Easter Tide. This is Easter four um, at the Parish of the Good Shepherd Wabin. I'm Father Michael Bousquet. Welcome. Uh, our previous parts one and two are posted online on our YouTube page, so you can always go and peruse those. And we're going to jump right into it. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Dawn Joy, if you can. I can. See. Perfect. Okay. I see. Okay, so where are we? We dealt with death last week. This week, we're dealing with judgment. It just gets better and better, right? Okay, so judgment. Where, what is the concept of judgment? Of course, there's lots of different judgments within our scriptures, but we're talking about judgment at the end of time, the eschaton, what might be called uh, the final judgment. And we reference this in our Nicene Creed. Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And for us, <clears throat> most of this judgment uh, theology and, and belief about uh, the final judgment comes to us from the book of Revelation, um, particularly Revelation 20 and 21. This is the, uh, of course, the entire book of Revelation is an interesting text, but chapter 20 and chapter 21 is really where all the meat is that people are very interested in. There's a lot of meat in it, but these chapters in particular. So here in chapter 20, this is verses 11 and 13. It talks about uh, Christ's judgment, right? <clears throat> um, then I, John, John of uh, the book of Revelation, the Revelation according to John, um, John of Patmos, right? Then I, John, saw a great white throne and one who sat on it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. And also another book was opened, the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them and all were judged according to what they had done. So this is the, this is the final judgment. All those who have died, no matter where they've died, whether they've died at sea or, or they died you know, in, in, on land and were buried in a tomb, wherever their souls may be, um, they were given up and sent before the great white throne to be judged by, by Jesus, right? This is the, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the object of, of this judgment. Who, who is the one judging? It's Jesus. Well, before we get into a little bit more about judgment, I want to, to take a step back and talk about Jesus, this, this person who is judging us, right? So what of Jesus, right? Let's think back to how all this started. Jesus died on the cross, and what happened between then and Easter Sunday? A little bit uncertain. Um, we believe that, that his body was certainly in the tomb, but his soul descended to the dead, right? And maybe Jesus fought Satan in hell, right? Um, we don't know. But even that, right, even that belief is beginning to separate a little bit from what we talked about last week in terms of the Jewish sense of the self. Jewish sense of the self is rooted in our bodies, right? So I am me, right? And if I die, my body is dead, but that's me, right? There's no sense that there's a, a soul that can be separated from my body in the Jewish sense. And yet here we go with Jesus that, that there is a sense that there is a spirit, the second person of the Trinity, right? That is eternal and everlasting and, and something perhaps apart from that body that died on Good Friday, right? But in any event, Jesus's spirit and body are reunited on Easter Sunday, and he's, he's resurrected. He has a body. It is a, a fleshly body. It, it is flesh and bone, right? And it still bears the wounds of the crucifixion, but it is a resurrected Jesus. And he walks about amongst his disciples. He, he teaches them a bit, um, has a meal with them, several meals with them. And then he ascends into heaven in bodily form, right? And this is unique, right? Uh, no one else ascends into heaven in bodily form with the possible exception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, this is not scriptural in any sense, but it is the tradition, usually uh, Orthodox and, and Roman um, uh, in the West tradition, that Mary also gets a body in heaven, right? Now, Mary did not ascend, right? The verb to ascend puts agency on the, the thing that is moving upwards, right? Um, Mary did not ascend into heaven. She was assumed into heaven, um, which kind of sounds like there's a big vacuum cleaner that sucked her up. Um, but 
<laughs> depending on where your tradition lies, right? Um, Jesus and Mary uh, might be the only two people in heaven who actually have a body, right? Um, so here's actually a, a, an image, right, that we all have of, of heaven, right? So there's Jesus right in the center there. Um, above Jesus is God the Father with his little uh, doctoral cap on because he's very smart. Um, and underneath Jesus is the, is the Holy Spirit in dove form, right? But look, you've got Mary next to Jesus, and that's probably, uh, oh, I don't know, some disciple, maybe Peter, maybe John, can't really make it out, um, next to, next to uh, Jesus on Jesus' left hand. And then you have all the other apostles and disciples sort of spread out, right? And you have angels hovering above, and you've got some cherubs hovering below, right? And then all of us down here on the earth, uh, down below. This is, this is an image of heaven. And yet, <clears throat> scripturally speaking, all of the disciples, Peter, John, James, you name them, everyone who's ever died, if we believe in now the Hellenized sense of the self, right, all of their bodies are still down here on earth. And what's up in heaven is some sort of um, disembodied spirit, which if you really think about it for, for a fast second, it's a very odd image of heaven. There's heaven, right, um, filled with light and love and sort of disembodied spirits. And then somewhere in there, <laughs> there's a body. There's Jesus in flesh and blood up there. I don't know what he's standing on. I don't know how gravity works, but he's got a body in heaven and nobody else does. So maybe another image of heaven is kind of just Jesus sitting there. And maybe his mom is with him too, if you believe that Mary also ascent, or, or was assumed into heaven um, in bodily form. Um, but the Orthodox belief is that there are no other bodies in heaven, at least not yet. So what this, this is speaking to is this interim period, right? So what happens after we die and before everything that's to come, right? There is heaven and, and there is possibly hell as well. So <clears throat> this is sort of the process, our lives and, and what we're talking about here. We die and then our bodies that are corruptible remain here on earth. The only two people, only one person, but possibly two people to escape that fate are Jesus himself and maybe his mother, Mary, right? Their bodies get to go up to heaven, but all the rest of us, our bodies remain here on earth and our souls go somewhere else, either to heaven or to hell. And then there's this long period um, where in time, right, we exist as disembodied spirits. And then there's the eschaton. There's, the, there's what happens at the end the second coming, the final judgment, everything in the book of Revelation, right? And then very end of Revelation chapter 21, we get the final resolution of everything, which is a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation, resurrection, what God ultimately intends. Um, this, is, this is actually what Christians believe in terms of our timeline. And we sort of exist in this, this middle period at least after we die, of a heaven or hell, a disembodied one. But what this also points to is that there is perhaps two judgments. So when we die, there's a first judgment of our souls because God has to figure out where to, where to park us temporarily, right? Until the eschaton happens, right? Until the, the final summation of time, what's, gotta, what's God going to do with all these, these disembodied souls, right? He's got to park them somewhere. They either go to heaven or they go to hell, right? So there's got to be a judgment at our death, right? That's the first judgment. But then <clears throat> if you read the book of Revelation, a lot of things happen, a lot of complicated things happen, but there is the final judgment. And that judgment is the judgment that Christians really care about. The judgment in scripture, when it talks about Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, we're talking about this final judgment. We only call it a final judgment or a second judgment because we presuppose a first judgment. And we only presuppose a first judgment because again, we're wondering what's going to happen <laughs> to our souls after we die. We're not Jews, right? We, we don't have a Jewish sense of the self where everything is unified. We have a, a Hellenized, a Greek sense of the self that the body and the soul of the spirit can be separated and one can be perishable and one is everlasting. And because we have that belief, we need to figure out what to do with what is eternal and everlasting for the centuries, millennia, eons, however long it takes before 
Jesus comes back for that second coming. And so that's why we, we, we've sort of forced ourselves into a corner to say there is a first judgment at death where God determines whether we go to heaven or hell. But then there, the, the judgment that scripture talks about is the final judgment, a second judgment. And then God makes all creation new. So let's, let's go back to um, Revelation for a bit to just sort of discover what's happening with Revelation. This is a long quote, but it's kind of important because this is where a lot of Christians get hung up. <clears throat> so this is um, Revelation chapter 20. I think it's actually the entirety of chapter 20. Um, a lot's going on here. Let me, let me expound for you and sort of paint this, this wonderful picture that John of Patmos had, this revelation that he had. Um, I saw an angel coming down from heaven and holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain, right? He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations anymore um, until the thousand years uh, were ended. And then after that, he has to be let out for a little while. I love that verse, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, let out for a little while. Okay, well, then I saw thrones and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus. So these are the saints, the good guys, right? Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its brand on their foreheads or their hands. So these are the saints of the church, right? <clears throat> And they came to life, <clears throat> they came to life and reigned. Um, <clears throat> they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended, okay? And this is the first resurrection, hmm, okay. Blessed and holy are those um, who share in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years, <clears throat> okay. When the thousand years are ended, right, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out and deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, <clears throat> satanic names, right, in order to gather them for the battle. And they are as numerous as the sands of the sea. And they, they marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and consumed them, right? The devil who had, been, who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Happy ending, right? Okay, then I saw, this is where we came in earlier, then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it, this is Christ, right? Um, and heaven and earth fled from his presence because of course you fear God, right? No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened, another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up their dead who were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them and all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Wow, <clears throat> that is some, that's a, that's a rip roaring tale if I ever read one. Uh, that's some really intense imagery. Um, it's a cosmic battle. It's a cosmic battle between good and evil. And you can see, Thrown in here, there, here, there, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. And <clears throat> the problem is, it is so convoluted, it's not actually clear. <laughs> um, now, there's some Christians who would say, this is crystal clear. You read this and you can map it all out. It, it tells you exactly how the end of time is going to play out. Um, there are other Christians who say, well, it's, it's not as clear as you might make it out to be. Um, and then there are some Christians who say, there's no clarity at all, <laughs> that this is all metaphor and vague. Um, and these sort of three different terms, premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism sort of map onto those different readings of the book of Revelation, the book of the end of the Revelation. So here's a, a way of understanding it. Premillennialism is what a lot of evangelical Christians today believe. They believe in a literal reading of Revelation and a literal reading that says, this is, this is quite clear. This is going to map it out clearly. Jesus died, cross, rose again, ascended into heaven. <clears throat> We're getting, existing through time, but there's going to be a second coming of Christ. Christ will come again, right? 
And <clears throat> this is, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the pink box here, sort of the pre-tribulational or dispensational pre-millennialism. So Jesus comes again, a second coming. And then as we read in the, in the previous uh, bit there, um, uh, the, the, the saints, those, the martyrs who had been beheaded for Christ and the word of God, um, <clears throat> sort of come and are, are raised again. This is, this is the, the rapture, right? All of those who are saintly and godly and belong in heaven, boom, they're taken out of the equation altogether. They're, they, they're, they've gone to paradise. They don't have to deal with anything that's going to come. And what is coming? Hmm. Well, what's coming is a time of tribulation, right? <clears throat> um, and this thousand years, right, when, when, when the devil <laughs> sort of comes out and uh, sort of attacks the world and attacks um, <clears throat> the saints, right, who are left on earth, the remnants, I should say, um, this is a time of tribulation. And then uh, there is uh, this second coming of Christ so in, in this pre-tribulational identity is actually like a third coming, right? It's a second coming and then a third coming. It's two different ones. But if you look in the, in the sort of post-tribulational premillennialism, there's a second coming, Christ comes again. And then there's a, a reign of 1000 years of goodness when Christ rules the earth. And then there's going to be a judgment when Jesus sort of says, puts a bow on it, it's all over now. We're going to have a new creation. Um, <clears throat> if you sort of map out Revelation 20, that's what it would read as for many Christians. Postmillennialism <clears throat> developed much later in the church, right around like the 19th century. Um, a lot of the Christian abolitionists in, uh, in America were postmillennials. Um, they... Uh, a lot of the social justice movements um, in the 19th and 20th centuries were also sort of adopted a post-millennial view, which is that thousand year reign of Christ, when things were good, we're actually in that right now. That all of those prophecies that, that, that were described in Revelation, that, you know, that, that Satan would be bound and then he would be released and there would be tribulations and all of these things, those actually just, they, they happened. They did happen some point in the past and we're past that now, and we're actually living within the millennium. We're living within the thousand years of things getting better and better and better. And there was an idea actually early in the church um, that perhaps the thousand years after the ascension of Jesus was that millennium. The, the, the age of the church was the age of goodness when slowly but surely, you know, we were conquering whatever remnants of Satan were here on earth. And the world was getting better and better. The, the, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, right? So we are living in this, this time of, uh, of peace and prosperity and of, of the reign of Christ through his church. And that at some future point after the thousand years that, well, Jesus will, will come back um, and not only come back, but also do the last judgment at that point. <clears throat> But they have a very specific idea that those prophecies were true, right? About Gog and Magog, the imprisonment of Satan, all of these things that were in Revelation were literally true, but they, they did actually happen. And they tried to map on to past events um, specific things that could be cited in Revelation. And we're now living within this literal thousand years. Well, that's caused some problems, right? Like for anyone who, who pegs a certain time frame to reality, when the year 1000 rolled around in, in Europe, people were thinking, oh, this, this is the second coming. Of course, Jesus did not come in power and glory in the year 1000 or in the year 1033 or whatever year you want to say. At the end of the first millennium, there was no second coming. So people said, ah, well, this thousand year period had to sort of frame shift, right? We're somewhere in it, but it keeps moving along <laughs> in history. But it is a thousand years. And there was some point where we started into it. Um, this is why the abolition movement in the 19th century thought, absolutely, we're, we're definitely in this because we're making constructive gains in the world to bring about a more fuller kingdom of God. Justice is reigning. It's clear now that we are living in the thousand years. 
the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox, but also the Western Orthodox Church, what um, Orthodoxy, what Roman Catholicism, what Lutheranism, Anglicanism, sort of the, the mainline churches all believe um, is that, you know, of course, scripture, we take scripture too seriously to take scripture literally, right? So it has always been sort of the, the tradition of the church that revelation is this extended metaphor, that it's not to be taken so literally that every, every aspect and move of the eschaton is literally how it unfolds. And so Revelation 20 is seen as a metaphor. And the thousand years that keeps being mentioned is not a literal 1,000 years, but it's a way of saying a long time, right? Um, just like in, in scripture, whenever you hear the word 40, 40 is, is sort of a, a bell that says, we're talking about a lot, right? We're not talking about a literal amount of 40, whatever it is. It's just a lot. 40 is, is meant to, to convey this sense of, um, of plenty of abundance, but also of, of multiplicity. Same thing with a thousand. It just means a really, really long time. Most people can't really fathom what a thousand years is like. So you throw in a thousand years just to say it takes a really long time. And so amillennialism says there's no literal thousand years. It's just time that we live in now. Everything post resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ is this millennial, this millennium, but it's not a thousand years. It's, it's sort of a uh, a non-thousand year, thousand years. It's just sort of the, the length and breadth of time until we get to the eschaton, until we get to the second judgment, the final judgment, and the second coming. Um, so we as Episcopalians, as Anglicans, are usually amillennials. Usually, I say, because again, <clears throat> some of you may have come into the Episcopal Church uh, from a more uh, Baptist or evangelical tradition, um, a sort of a Protestant tradition that might read scripture much, much more literally. And I've actually known some Episcopalians who are pre-millennials, right? Um, <clears throat> the problem with both post-millennials and pre-millennials is that because they, they tie the events of resurrection to a literal time frame in, in the space-time continuum, right? Um, it means that we have a, 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 a role to play in the salvation of the world? Um, this is a big, big question. Remember back to uh, part one of this discussion, I talked about eschatology and I had all those little binaries, right? One of them is, is it future oriented or is it, is it imminent? Is it realized in time, right? Is this something for the future? Or is this something for now? Um, and if you're one of these pre or post millennials, you absolutely believe this is something for now and something that you actually have a, a hand in. And it doesn't help that the book of Revelation in some ways supports this, right? Because how are we judged? We're judged according to our works, our deeds, right? It's what we've done that determines whether we go to heaven or hell. Um, this is perhaps very different from Christians who believe that Salvation is unearned, right? It's not about works, it's about grace, right? So um, I should say, good theology is one that will leave you with more questions than answers, right? So I'm not here to, to clear anything up. I'm here to, to elucidate how muddy theology is, right? I, I'm, I'm showing you all the different ways in which you can look at eschatology and see how confusing it is. I'm not going to give you crystal clear answers, okay? That's my aside. But the book of Revelation, where it says we are judged according to our works, and we go to heaven or hell based on what we've done in our lives, says that clearly we have a role to play in our own salvation. And, you know, for some uh, evangelical Christians, if we, can, if we can essentially degrade the world enough, and there are Christians who believe this, destroy the environment, promote war and chaos, well, you're pushing the timeline along faster and faster to get to this second coming, right? We want to actually force God's hand to come in and save everything, right? Um, this is not what I believe at all, but you might have heard this uh, from some Christians out there that we can actually bring about the second coming if we make things crappy enough, excuse my language, but essentially that's, that's a theology that you can glean out of premillennialism. Um, a good reason why there are some scriptures which we should not take literally um, because again, 
scripture is the inspired word of God. There is truth in scripture. And if you take scriptures literally, oftentimes you can, you can actually override the truth and, and find a falsehood, right? Because our own interpretations are not exactly uh, in line with what the church has always held. And from the beginning, the church has held revelation, not as a historical book, but a book of, of poetry and prophecy, right? It is, it's a book of metaphors and imagery, good imagery, um, thrilling imagery in some ways, but it is very different from um, historical books, books that were intended to convey fact. So prophecies and facts are different within scriptural traditions, and we need to hold on to that. So that's me editorializing my, my apologies. Um, okay, where are we with my slide? Okay, um, this is where I'm gonna end. I'm just gonna end with a question today. So what happens after the second or this last judgment? This is ultimately the big question. This is what we should care about. Um, a lot of Christians go about thinking, okay, if I'm gonna be judged on what I do in my life, if my acts, my deeds are gonna determine whether I go to heaven or hell, um, you know, I, I need to need to focus on that, right? This is this is an important thing. And yet, <clears throat> heaven and hell are not not the ultimate end of the story, right? So there is something that happens in chapter twenty one. We read about chapter twenty in Revelation. Chapter twenty one is its own problem in a different way. Um, heaven and hell is not ultimately where we want to be. Once we get to chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, we're going to find out that God is going to, to create a new heaven and a new earth, right? And that the heavenly Jerusalem will descend to earth, and that this is where resurrection is actually going to be affected, that people will get their bodies back, just like Jesus got his body, right? We will all have resurrected bodies, and we will live on earth in peace and harmony, um, chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, right? This is the hope is there still a disembodied heaven or a disembodied hell after the second judgment? That is a very pertinent question. The heaven and hell that we believe in now is, is only a contingency. It's only something that we've had to posit because we believe that our souls are eternal and need to be parked somewhere in the meantime. But the current heaven and hell that we believe in that exists right now, that's going to pass away. Everything old is passing away at the eschaton. So what is happening after the eschaton? Is there another heaven and hell where there are disembodied spirits, or is it only the new creation and the new Jerusalem? That is the question that we need to hold on to um, because, and I should say, um, where do you end up after the second judgment? Like, you know, according to chapter 20 of Revelation, it does sound like there are some people who are consigned to, to damnation for all eternity. They, they, there are some people who miss out on the new Jerusalem, the new creation, right? Um, we don't want to be part of those people, right? So maybe there is a new creation and there's also a new hell, right? A new hell where those who are, are truly damned, not, not this temporary damnation of this hell, right? But who are maybe truly damned, that's where they go. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. We'll have to deal with that when we get to hell um, <laughs> in this adult form series, not literally, right? Uh, so in this series, um, in a couple of weeks time, when we do hell, um, we'll, we'll address this question. But this is where we're going. When I talk about heaven and hell for the next parts of this adult form series, I want to talk about what's happening after the second judgment, because our concepts of heaven and hell now, what happens to our souls after we die in this lifetime? It's ultimately not, and I do mean ultimately in the literal sense, ultimately it is not important because it is not ultimate. Heaven and hell as, as Christianity has sort of envisioned it for what happens after we die right now is a temporary place. It, it's, it's, a, it, it's a place that doesn't make sense, right? Because it wouldn't make sense for all these disembodied spirits to be around sort of this one guy, Jesus, who has his body. Um, no one else in heaven has bodies. The Father does not have a body. The Spirit does not have a body. Angels do not have bodies. Angels are pure spirits, right? Um, according to Christian tradition, no one has a body except for Jesus in heaven. Now, all angels, the Holy Spirit, they have appeared in bodily form here on earth. 
but it's not the same thing as saying that they have bodies. Um, so what Christians have posited for heaven, this temporary heaven that exists now, is in some ways a little uh, uh, nonsensical, right? I, I think it'd be very weird to go up to heaven as a disembodied spirit and see Jesus and Jesus alone sort of hanging out there with the body and just surrounded by light. Maybe, maybe that could work, right? I, I had a, a picture of that. Um, <laughs> and it might work for you. But what I ultimately hope for and what scripturally Christians hope for is this new creation where everyone is embodied again. Um, so it brings all this sort of Hellenized sense of the self back in union with the Jewish sense of the self. We, are, we, are, we, we, come, we become unified yet again, body and soul. That's the ultimate goal. So we'll talk about heaven and hell um, in terms of, of what is to come after the second judgment in our future weeks. I will uh, leave it there. Um, again, I hope, I, I, I hope I've muddied everything up for you. <laughs> That's my goal. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll open it up for questions. Silence. You know, Wanna, I, no, no, I just want to know. I mean, it's it, it's a lot to take in. So, and I'm not. It is. I'm not pretending that I I can take it all in. And I I think what what this all makes me wonder. And you know, I'm I'm here at this forum, so you know I'm interested and I care and yeah. I, I go to all of them. So don't don't take this the wrong way. But in this particular topic, I'm sort of wondering. I don't mean to say what difference it makes, but what I mean is. If, if we, there, there, there aren't going to be any answers, you know, to all this. There aren't going to be any clear, at least not any clear answers. Yeah. I mean, we can all say, we read an article and we did this, and there's a lot of data that show, you know, but we don't know what happens afterwards, period, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking to myself that I think what matters the most in a really simplistic way is how we feel about it. Like, do we feel mm -hmm. like the judgment um, and that always brings up, and I know I've said this many times, but that always brings up for me that whole tension between is it acts or is it your beliefs, you know, that whole yes. thing, which yeah. is just a big can of worms. But I think what matters is that if we can come to peace with it and feel like there's something terrific coming mm -hmm. later, not in the sense like I want to die because there's something great coming later, but, right. you know, have a certain peace with it. The problem with what I'm saying, the problem with taking that approach is, what if you have people who really and truly are evil, horrible people, and they're coming to terms and they're saying, well, it's yeah. okay that we killed all those Jews during the Holocaust, because, you know, that was the right thing to do. They were inferior people, so I'm fine. You know, so it isn't always good enough, but then who's judging all that? So, right. So, um, great point, Dawn. And so another way of, of presenting what I just presented is to say scripture was, was written by many different people, right? God inspired many different people to write different types of scripture. And the entire purpose of God's inspired word is to give us comfort and to give us reassurance. It is not to provide a systematic, coherent view of, of the divine mystery. Right? We get glimpses here and there, and different glimpses reassure us in different ways, but when you put them together, they create a muddy picture. They create inconsistencies and incoherencies. Um, and so you could certainly understand, absolutely. What would make, what would reassure me? Bad people are punished, right? So I want some sort of judgment where the good people finally went out and the bad people get damned. That would make me feel good, right? And so voila, we have an inspired scripture. That, that paints that picture. And yet, you know, I also, what would reassure me is that my salvation is not incumbent upon my own sinful self, right? That, that God, who is more powerful than any sin, is the only sole agent that can save me. That reassures me. Um, and so we have scriptures that, that talk about the, the, the munificence of God's grace. Wonderful. But you put these two scriptures in, in contact and they're inconsistent, right? So what, what's the truth, right? Is it our, our, is it our actions that, that have a hand in our salvation or is it God and God alone who saves us? Both can't be true, right, right? Well, this is, this is part of the mystery of God, right? We, our, our 
Our minds do not work well with binaries. We like to think of either or. Either something can be true or something else is true, not both. We can't think of, of both and in terms of, of um, contradictions. And yet that's exactly where God is. God can say both of these things are true in different ways, in ways that we'll never be able to understand. But instead of trying to hammer out a coherent and consistent theology from all of scriptures, what if instead we just said, okay, how is this scripture reassuring me in this moment? And if there's some way that the scripture starts to um, discomfort me, uh-oh, what about all these Nazis who are going to rely on God's grace? You know, they're, they're doing bad things. They're going to be saved anyway. Ah, don't go there, right? That scripture is not for you at that moment, right? <laughs> um, maybe you need to lean into the, the, the God's judgment as, as, a, as an act of righteousness for your own reassurance, right? You might be in a different place, though. You might think, oh, well, I, I kind of like a God who is all forgiving and can forgive even the worst, worst of humanity. Maybe that's something that you want to lean into. Um, and at different times in our life, we need to lean into different scriptures. Um, the point of this adult forum is sort of to lay out all these different concepts and to say, see, <laughs> they're different. They're different in fundamental ways. And that's OK just so long as you understand we're not trying to, to square the circle here. We're, we're, we're good with these tensions. <clears throat> other thoughts, other questions? Yes, Mary Ellen. It, it, well, of course it's a lot to take in and I just <clears throat> took a quick look at um, all of chapter 21 and chapter 22 is the last chapter of Revelation. Yep. So <clears throat> to take it in its whole, is actually very helpful. And Jesus is the one who speaks to John at the very end of uh, yeah. chapter 22. And uh, the heading of that chapter is Jesus is coming. So if we take this and know Jesus is coming mm -hmm. and live quietly with that, and Jesus has promised that he would come, he promises yes. at the time of ascension that he will come. He promises that he will send an advocate. So whatever meaning we have on this mm -hmm. journey, on this life that we each have right now with our bodies and the people that we engage with, the, how our life is surrounded with family and friends and, and mm -hmm. good people and some not so great people to hang out with. Um, we remember that you know, just remember maybe the holiness of it um, mm -hmm. to be with John and to to read it is not confusing. I wouldn't want to be literal like the evangelicals want to take it literally and pick out this period of time. That's not exactly what the book says. So yeah. I wouldn't do that. I, I do have it interesting that you referred last week that I happened to do this NDE research. And I have. I've done the NDE research for probably the last three years right yep it, for the first and it is fascinating to listen to them who have died and have had a moment of of the first death and they pass over and that first judgment is they all call it consistently the life review everyone calls it the life review even before they started to the nde group started to use that term um sometimes i've heard people say oh when you were near drowning and you didn't drown, did your whole life come before you? And some people say, yeah, as a matter of fact, it did. I, I saw my whole life quickly before me. But in the life review, the life review is interesting. And I pay attention to some of these people because there are, there are thousands of them. It's supposed to be something like 10% of the world's population have these experiences. Not everyone, but let's say the 10%. But the 10% that are coming back do tell us that there's a heaven do tell us that there's this bright, the brightness of light. Many have seen Jesus and many have seen hell and they know that they mm. don't want to be there. Um, so the first judgment, I, if I want to use it in the terms that we're being given in my everyday journey life is, okay, fine, read a couple of these and sort of go with it and see what yeah. you think. And then, and then just, um, and then just know that we, as Christians, as Anglo-Catholic Christians and at Good Shepherd, that we're supposed to do good works and we're supposed to be good people. And the first thing Father Jay says at the very 
um, start of the services, you know, there are two great, the best, the two great commandments are love God above all else and love your neighbor as yourself. So mm-hmm. just put it to that. And, and the NDE people also, I had said last week, they let us know, don't, don't worry too much about death, you know, and they do this life is we're told everywhere, you know, is pretty darn temporary. Mm-hmm. And so I go with that and revelation is revelation. We can just keep rereading it, study yeah. it, be well, with it. You know, Mary Ellen, I think the, the, one of the first things you said is really important, which is what is the overarching message of the end of revelation? Christ is coming again. And for Christians, that is a, should be a really encouraging statement, right? That Christ is going to come and be with us again. Um, this was, this was the, the foundation of the reassurances that the early church had when Jesus literally was with them again. What did he say time and time again? Peace be with you. Because all of the anxiety, all of the worry that they had around the death and crucifixion of Jesus, all of that melted away when he was with them yet again. And any worries that we have, should melt away when Christ comes again for us. Problem is, people have sort of <clears throat> hooked themselves into these little details of Christ coming again, especially the issues of judgment, right? And people start started feeling afraid. I don't know if I want Jesus to come again because what if Jesus comes again and judges me and judges me harshly, right? Um, this is where the, the over-the-top details of the book of Revelation can actually be a hindrance, right? Um, I'm sure that God gave John of Patmos this revelation as a means of reassurance. Maybe John really wanted to see a cosmic battle between good and evil and for good to triumph, right? And for all those who have sinned to be punished, right? And this was, an, this was what would be reassuring for him. And this is how Christ coming back was manifested as a reassurance for John of Patmos. And if you are like John of Patmos, then yeah, you read, you read Revelation, you're right there with him, cheering on this battle and, and saying good's going to win. If you are more, um, <clears throat> you're more good with ambiguity, Revelation could be a scary text, right? Because you're, maybe you're not so confident in yourself that you would be on the winning side. What if, what if God thinks that you're bad, right? This is why some people are afraid of the book of Revelation, or they want to avoid it altogether, because it's so militant and so uh, so sure of itself, right? And for a lot of Christians that are more okay with ambiguity and, and having faith in mystery, um, it can be a difficult text, right? And, and I think it is for a lot of us. Um, I know a lot of Episcopalians don't read the book of Revelation because it, it, it seems so strident in ways in which we are not very strident in our faith to say this is exactly how it's going to happen, right? Um, we embrace mystery. Uh, there are other Christians out there who really lean into sort of strident, militant Christianity, and that's why they love the book of Revelation. Um, all this is, again, is to say, what is the goal of scripture? To reassure us. And so your point, Mary Ellen, Christ is coming again. That's the message may that be a message of peace and reassurance for you. Absolutely. Other Thank thoughts? Um, yeah, uh, Joy, or, or there's only four of us. So Joy, do you have anything to, to share or any questions? Uh, well, I just want to thank you for um, all of this and, and about sort of the overview of scripture in that it's meant to comfort and not to frighten us. Absolutely. That's good to remember. And um, it's been a, a wonderful series. It, it is. I'm glad. Hilarious. So. I'm so glad, Joy. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, if ever you, you're reading scripture and you're feeling, I don't like this. This feels bad to me. That scripture is probably not for you at this point in your life right? It's, it's, it's for someone else at a different place. And because the ultimate goal of scripture is to give us comfort and to give us hope, right? Um, it's not to say it's not meant to be challenging, right? God always challenges us and pushes us, but not in ways that make us feel um, afraid, right? And if you feel like judgment 
This, this final judgment is like the sword of Damocles hovering over you. That's not its purpose, right? Its purpose is to say that God is a God of justice, right? And will right every wrong. And if that's the reassurance that you need to hear, I will give you that reassurance by saying there's a final judgment. But there are many Christians who, who want to avoid that altogether and say, how can God, a God of love, um, judge me and weigh my soul? Because, you know, we're all sinners, right? You know, if you judge rightly, God, who, who can stand before you? No one can. We're all guilty of sin. No one can be saved if you judge rightly. Um, if that's the case, then judgment, this idea of final judgment, is not a reassuring concept. And therefore, it's maybe something that you need to put aside. It's not something that's false, but it's not something that's good for you to hear at this point, because there's a different message in scripture that is more speaking to your soul. Um, anyway, that's- Well, I'm thinking uh, also, uh, this morning, trying to help a friend. I have hmm. a friend who died. Hmm. Um, and her son uh, is going to call me to talk about scripture that she might mm -hmm. like and hymns. And so I was reading through and it's like, you're saying, I'm thinking about people who hear this and some of the suggestions in the burial yeah. service mm -hmm. in their book, thinking, no, I, you know, that her sons don't want to hear this. I don't think they're quite church. So I've been looking for comfort in all, mm -hmm. all of those. And um it's a little hard to come by. Some of those can be hard to hear at a funeral. So you, you are absolutely right, Joy. Um, you know, I, when I was a chaplain in the hospital, um, <clears throat> if I was ever at a bedside of a patient who was near death at the end of life, um, at the end of this life, I, there's a lot of the committal service in the Book of Common Prayer. Um, so the committal, which is the prayers that you would normally say at the graveside when you're, when you're putting the body into the ground or in the columbarium. Um, and the, these are, in my opinion, very safe prayers, prayers of comfort and hope. Um, it sort of avoids a lot of the, the fraught judgment and sort of tension of, you know, we, we petition you, God, to, to get this body into heaven, right, that you can get into the, in the burial service, right, because the committal service is a pastoral service, pastoral both in the, in the, the literal meaning, because you're usually out in a field, right, it, it's, 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 it's pastoral, um, but also it's a service uh, for the surviving family, right, the, the person who has died is, is no longer there, right, is, if we believe in the Hellenized sense of the self, it's just a body, right, and their soul is somewhere else, so this is a this service um, not a service for the body, but a service for the loved ones. And well, they will hear. They will hear all of that. Oh, they they will. They will. But uh, the prayers that are offered, in in my opinion, are the prayers that. So I'm I'm pulling. I just had it and I closed my book. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> well, it's more not the prayers yeah. that will be in the service. It'll be a right it's, one service in New York yep. City, Saint Ignatius. But it's the yeah. the readings and hymns. <clears throat> And so I was trying. Right. To so the, the committal does not actually have any any scriptures um, that that you sort of read. It just has it's it's a list of prayers and I'm colics. About back in the part where um, you know it, it gives you the choices. Mm -hmm. the Old yeah. Testament comes out. That's what I'm pouring over. Yeah. Um, so these are referenced. Sorry, in the new. It's New Testament scriptures, but then let's see. <clears throat> yeah, so page 470 uh, in the Book of Common Prayer, the burial right, right one, um, lists the Old Testament scriptures that you could read. Um, and again, all of these are meant to, to comfort, right? But they might have an edge to them. On page, uh, on page 480, it has the, the uh, gospel. Um, passages, which incidentally are all from the Gospel of John. Um, and some of these, you know, they, they can be very reassuring, but some of them also have an edge to them, especially if people at the burial service um, are not Christian, right? Um, there's definitely a sense that, you know, oh, Christians get into heaven and all those who don't, <laughs> tough cookies, right? Um, you know, this, uh, which one is it? Let's see. Um, <clears throat> 
I believe it's John 11. Um, I'm the resurrection and the life. Um, yeah. So that's the, that's the, we actually talked about this um, at the, the Compromance retreat this past weekend. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Um, you know, if you are a person of faith and your loved one is a person of faith, that's wonderful, right? Yeah, we have trust and faith that we have found the way, the truth, and the life, and that our soul and the souls of our loved ones have made it to the Father, have made it to God. Um, and yet, what if I have a, Christ, a non-Christian friend with me in the pew next to me, right? They're listening to that and they hear a very exclusionary text and one that says, ah, oh, you don't get to go to heaven, right? Hmm. Well, um, that's, uh, I can give a whole sermon on that and explain how it's not exclusionary. Um, it's a time for, for another place. But yeah, scriptures, the problem with scriptures is that the underlying message is one of reassurance. And yet all of us are in a different place in our life. And what is reassuring for some people is very fraught for other people. Um, there's no, practically no scriptures that are just so anodyne and, and blah that everyone just accepts them as, as you know, sort of pablum um, and, 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 you know, a good, good bit of scripture, right? Maybe love your neighbor as yourself. Well, even that, right? <laughs> what about people who, um, who struggle to love themselves, right? <laughs> a lot of scripture can be complicated. Um, but I think out of the five choice yeah. i only found one that i thought um was mostly anodyne uh yeah and i can't remember now which it was i think it was lamentations or maybe one of the isaiahs anyway i didn't yeah. need to get onto that but i, I just will... like what you said about scripture yeah. and how yeah. we should read it yep well we well, can look joy, at that joy I'm... the song joy oh. um Joy, this, if you take a look at the psalm, while Michael was just referring to a few things, um, I just looked up like I have here. I just opened it randomly. Psalm 108, verses 1 through 5. Um, you know, be exalted, O God, above all the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. You, you'll find something possibly in the psalms, um, in any of them. Uh, sing to the well, Lord. Already recommended. That, it's all right. I was only looking for Old Testament. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. I'm mindful um, of our time because we, we are Michael, over our time. Father right. Michael, a quick question. I, when not, is John, John of Patmos is, I'm um, John of Patmos, is that the John who was with Mary, the beloved John? Or no. what, give me a the, time frame. So John, John, of, John, of, John, of, John of Patmos um, was about 100 years um, after Jesus's uh, life and movement. So I, actually, uh, the book of Revelation was, was dated to about 120 AD. So this, this is a full, John of Patmos was not one of the 12 disciples, was not uh, a member of the, uh, the Jesus movement as it began. It was, he was a, um, someone who was living on, on the island of Patmos who was looking at the world falling to pieces, right? And in, in the midst of chaos, he had this divine revelation image of, of the glory to come, right? Um, and that's, and he wrote it all down. Uh, and interestingly, in that first 100, 200, 300 years of the church's history, there was a lot of apocalyptic um, revelations. Many different texts out there of people saying, ah, I, God gave me an image of, of what is to come. And the church, when it was sort of, finding out the canon, which texts are going to be included in the Bible. This was the only book of Revelation that they chose. And this is the one they said, this one is, this one's got some, some truth in it. These other ones are, are too far off the mark, right? Now, the thing with Revelation is nobody knows, wow, it's about future events. It's about things that have not happened, right? So by that very nature, um, you can't say whether it's true or not. Someone who hasn't been privy to that revelation can't say that whether it's true or not. Except, of course, we do believe that the church is guided by the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit guided the fathers and perhaps mothers, but probably fathers of the church to decide on this apocalyptic text as the one that contains some truth. But again, this is, this is apocalyptic literature is very different from the, the letters of Paul and the, the Gospels that deal with Jesus's life and the events 
soon thereafter in the early church. This was about a hundred years removed. Um, and, and that's uh, perfectly fine. Um, it's, you know, there are some Christian denominations that say the canon is not yet closed, right? That the Holy Spirit is still speaking um, and that we might actually get a brand new revelation and that the, the church, if so inspired, will accept that and put it into the canon. Probably not. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that the canon was not closed until a couple hundred years after Jesus is sort of an indication that in the early church, people were trying to figure out um, what is truth and what isn't, what's reassuring and, Mike, and what isn't. And Michael, you're not, you're not going to be doing this next week, right? So it's a, That's right. So next week, um, Father Jay is doing adult forum. Um, okay. I don't know if it will be recorded. Uh, it might be, okay. it might not be. And I have no idea what it's going to be on. Um, he might just do a one-off on something he wants to talk about, or he might actually have his take on eschatology. Right. Um, which, so we'll see you in two weeks then. See you in two weeks, we'll and we'll be doing right. heaven and hell. Okay. I'm trying to figure out if we want to do heaven first and then hell. I think I think I want to end on hell. So we might be doing heaven <laughs> in two weeks, and then we'll do hell. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a good ending because in my presentation, it's hell is abolished, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to show my hands right now. At the end of time, there is no hell. I was going to say, it's not like it's going to have any relevance to any of us. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Okay. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Have a good vacation. Take care. Yes. Bye. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Michael.